Good morning, readers. Today is Friday, July 30th, and you're listening to First Chapter Fridays, presented by the Baker Free Library. My name is Juliana, and I am the library's youth services librarian. Welcome to this week's program. Each Friday throughout the summer, I'll be sharing the first chapter of a middle grade book with you that explores the animal kingdom. If you like today's chapter, you can place a reserve on the featured book using the library's catalog or by calling the library at 224-7113. While you're listening today, feel free to jot down any thoughts, questions, or ideas you have about the story. You can also color or draw, pick up your room, build with Legos, or work on a craft project while you listen. All right, let's jump into today's story. This week, we travel all the way to the Borderlands jungle in Nepal at the base of the Himalayan mountains where the king's elephants are kept safe, until they aren't. This is A Circle of Elephants by Eric Dienersten. Thirteen-year-old Nandu lives in the newly established Royal Elephant Breeding Center on the edge of the Borderlands jungle in Nepal. Here, the king's elephants are to be raised under the protective watch of the stable. Nandu, along with his adoptive father, Suba Sahib, his mentors, friends, and the rest of the elephant drivers, is tested by man and nature as earthquakes, drought, wild herds, and rumors of poachers threaten the center. When Nandu's world is thrown into turmoil, so, too, is the world of Hira Prashad, the center's powerful bull elephant. An unbreakable bond of brotherhood drives Nandu and Hira Prashad together as they struggle to maintain the delicate natural order of life in the borderlands. Want to hear more of this incredible story? Let's begin reading A Circle of Elephants by Eric Dienersten. Prologue I once heard a story about a lonely elephant. The elephant lived in a mountain forest bordering a great ocean. Many elephants had lived in this forest, but now there was only one, an old male with giant tusks. The others had been killed for their ivory. Poachers tried several times to trap the old male, too, but they could not. The hunters soon feared the tusker, believing that he was a spirit elephant, too dangerous to approach. A game warden learned of the spirit elephant and began to track him. The warden was determined to protect the animal. He watched as the tusker spent his days wandering the forest, calling out to the others and listening for their trumpets in return, but none called back. One day the elephant climbed to the top of a ridge. He trumpeted to his lost family. Again, no one answered. Then the elephant entered a clearing with a view of the sea. The warden stayed nearby, unafraid, as the elephant looked out to the ocean. The air vibrated around him, but the warden could not make out any sound. He followed the elephant's gaze with his binoculars. Why would this powerful elephant stare out to sea, rumbling deeply to no one? Far away, the warden spotted a pod of humpback whales migrating along the coast. They broke the surface and rose high into the air before splashing back into the water. Had the whales called back to the elephant? The tusker stayed on the ridge for a week. The pod remained along the coast as well. Maybe, the warden thought, the whale stayed so long to comfort the lonely elephant. I think of this elephant often. I have even told his story to Hira Prashad, my giant tusker who leads our stable. There is a feeling in me, one so deep I cannot name it. I believe Hira Prashad feels it too, that our purpose in life is to look out for each other. We are brothers. And together, Hira Prashad and I must watch over the other animals that live at the mercy of humans. We must answer the call of the lonely trumpeters. Nandu, the king's elephant driver, Nepal. The monkeys in the trees, where their whistles and hoots ring in your ears. Gliding above the dirt and dust is a privilege, especially for me, a 13-year-old Tibetan orphan and the youngest elephant driver in all of Nepal. It is only when I get down from my elephant that the trouble starts. On New Year's Day, I rode with my tusker, Hira Prashad, to the highest point along the Great Sandbar River, two hours north and west of our elephant stable. This spot is called Lamati, named for its red clay cliffs. The view along the riverbank is like a painting. 
Bright green cattails sway in the foreground. Behind them, white sandbars reach out to the ochre bluffs and rippling water. We paused at the top of the cliffs to take in the moment. To me, this is the most beautiful place in the borderlands jungle, as wild and far from people as you can find. Maybe the isolation is the source of the real beauty. I think this place is here Prashad's favorite too. He rumbles each time we approach it. This will be our tradition, I said, as I rubbed the top of his head. On New Year's Day, we will come to these cliffs. Here, Prashad flapped his ears and lifted his trunk to the river. It had been almost six months since Dilly, my closest friend, and I had found Hira Prashad. He was being starved to death, chained to a tree in the courtyard of the local landlord we call the Python. The sight of the elephant's thin body and sunken eyes was too much for us to bear. Dilly and I bargained with the Python to sell us Hira Prashad. We saved my tusker's life that day, and he has never forgotten it. The Nepali New Year is a day to celebrate and thank the gods. It is now also the day we mark our brotherhood. On my command, Hira Prashad dropped to his knees and rolled to his side so I could climb off his back. He rose to his feet again and began grazing in the grassland, rippling the tall shoots with his curled trunk and stuffing them into his mouth. My tusker was hungry. He ate and ate while I wandered. Soon I heard the dull thuds of elephant dung hitting the ground behind me. Fortunately, the smell was sweet, like the grass elephants eat. I made my way to the edge of the cliff. The swift current of the river swept far below me. There had been no rain for months, but even in this drought the depth here was over my head. The cold, clear water of the great sandbar river is fed by the melting snows of the high Himalayas, straight north from where I stood. In the middle of the river, near a maze of sandbars, two narrow, half-submerged logs began to roll. I focused my binoculars to discover they were female gharial, the rare ancient crocodilian that still live along this river. Like a dinosaur, the gharial has scaly peaks along its back and a long thing snout to grab fish out of the river. I scanned the far bank beyond the gharial, where movement caught my eye. The rising heat waves made it difficult to see clearly, but I knew it was a wild elephant, a female with a small calf. Both were looking up at us on the ridge. I have heard stories that when an old elephant dies at our stable, she is reborn in her next life as a wild elephant that lives across the Great Sandbar River. I wondered if that young calf was my elephant mother, Debbie Kali, the only mother I've ever known, who died over a year ago. I hoped it was her, enjoying her next life. Suddenly, I felt Hira Prashad at my side. I never ceased to be amazed at how quietly elephants can move. The pads under their feet absorb all sound. Look here, Prashad, I said. That may be your mother across the river. Devi Kali, I had learned, was here Prashad's mother too. He had been separated from her as a baby, just as I had been separated from my birth parents. Here Prashad's soft rumbling turned into a long grumble, ending with a loud trumpet. What is it? The roar from the river made it difficult to hear, but I thought the wild elephant had trumpeted as well. Here Prashad rumbled again and stepped forward, wrapping his trunk around my chest and pulling me backward. I cried out, but here Prashad ignored me. He had never done such a thing before. I shouted at the elephant to let me go and kicked my legs as hard as I could. I was helpless and terrified that here Prashad was going to toss me into the river. He grabbed me even tighter around the waist with his trunk. What are you doing, here, Prashad? I yelled. For the first time ever, I was afraid of my brother elephant. I struggled to free myself, slapping at his trunk. He carried me twenty feet from the cliff's edge before he put me down and started swinging his trunk, herding me back from the cliff. Hira Prashad's angry rumbles kept me moving back farther and farther. Our roles had reversed. The elephant was commanding the driver. Scared, I took giant steps backward. I could not believe he would hurt me, but in my mind I heard the words of my father, Suba Sahib, the officer in charge of our stable. Remember, Nandu. Our elephants are still wild animals. We must humble ourselves to ride them. Hira Prashad pushed me into the grassland. I was so confused I failed to notice the dead silence. No peacocks, wild jungle fowl, or hornbills calling. Only seconds ago they had all been wailing. A nearby herd of spotted deer, over a hundred of them, stopped barking and stood at attention. At first I thought they were watching the lone wild dog that I saw darting through the clearing, but the deer seemed focused on something else. Hira Prashad sensed it, too. He banged his trunk on the ground and let out a screech I had never heard from an elephant. 
Hear a Prashad, I yelled. What do you know that you're not telling me? Just as I spoke, every tree around us started to shake. My head nodded up and down, and my arms wiggled left and right. I moved toward my elephant, but lost my balance as the earth swayed beneath my feet. I stumbled and fell. Hira Prashad lifted me up and pulled me farther into the grassland. I heard a long ripping as the place where I had been standing, the entire cliff's edge, collapsed into the river. Two trees bent over and fell, tearing the ground with their huge roots as they landed. The entire jungle trembled. More of the cliff sheared off and crashed into the river. Hira Prashad curled his trunk around me and held me to his leg, just as Devi Kali did when I was small. I pressed my face into his rough, warm skin, praying to the goddess of the forest, the one we call Bandavi. I pleaded with her to make it end. Instead, another great silk cotton tree went crashing down over the edge. The jungle was caving in around us, and no one could stop it. And that's where we'll stop for today, readers, right on a literal cliffhanger. If you'd like to hear more of this story, call the library or visit bowbakerfreelibrary.org to reserve A Circle of Elephants by Eric Dinnerstein. To hear the rest of the summer's featured titles, search for First Chapter Fridays on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere else you like to tune in. You can also view the library's entire catalog of episodes, past and present, at anchor.fm slash bfl5, or visit the library's website for the full archive. Thank you for listening to this episode of First Chapter Fridays. Tune in again next week for another great story.